Hello and welcome to Prism of the Past, a weekly series about historical events, people, and situations from the fascinating to the forgotten. I'm the Illuminati, and today we've got another volcano to talk about, one that I'm sure many of you have heard of, Mount St. Helens. We're just going to dive straight into it, talk about the history of Mount St. Helens, then get into the massive eruption that occurred in May, 1980. Since this major eruption occurred about 40 years ago, we'll be able to talk about the long-term effects of the eruption as well, and perhaps explore if another eruption seems likely in the future. So let's get into it. Mount St. Helens located in Washington state is primarily an explosive dacite volcano with a complex magma system. A dacite volcano simply means that the rock has a unique structure. It's typically composed of 62 to 69% silica and typically lighter in color. St. Helens is also a stratovolcano, which as we know from our very first episode of Weird Wild World, rest in peace, it's an explosive volcano with steep-sided symmetrical cones built up by the accumulation of debris from previous eruptions. Stratovolcanoes have plumbing systems that move magma from a chamber deep within the Earth's crust to vents at the surface. It's the classic baking soda type volcano that many may have built in class. Anyway, St. Helens was formed during four eruptive stages about 275,000 years ago, according to the USGS. Prior to about 12,800 years ago, tephra, lava domes, and pyroclastic flows were erupted, forming the older St. Helens edifice, edifice being the main portion of the volcano built up by eruptions. But a few lava flows extended beyond the base of the volcano. The bulk of the modern edifice above the 1980 crater floor was constructed during the last 3,000 years when the volcano erupted a wide variety of products from summit to flank vents. Historical eruptions in the 19th century originated from the Goat Rocks area on the north flank and were witnessed by early settlers. New unpublished data on the timing for Mount St. Helens eruptive activity have been analyzed, which improves some of the eruption dates cited in published literature. Since the massive 1980 eruption, we're going to discuss the summit elevation has decreased, likely in part because of erosion and crater wall collapses. St. Helens has gone through quite a few eruptive changes in its history as well. It went through the Ape Canyon eruptive stage around 40,000 years ago before having a dormant period for almost 15,000 years. We know this because its oldest ash deposits are about this old, despite the visible cone being only about 2,200 years old. According to the USGS, the early history of Mount St. Helens is poorly known and the initial stage called Ape Canyon covers a long time span. During this stage, lava domes erupted just west of the present volcano in two distinct periods one from 275 to 250,000 years ago, and the second from 160 to 35. It is possible that these two stages were separated by a long hiatus or that evidence for eruptive events between 250 to 160,000 years ago has either not been recognized or been buried by a younger volcanic deposits. Volcanism during the Ape Canyon stage produced a cluster of lava domes and maximum elevations of about 1,200 meters or 4,000 feet. Ash layers correlating to the two eruptive periods have been found as far east as central Washington, indicating that explosive eruptions also occurred. Much of the Ape Canyon stage history is recorded in a cougar age debris avalanche, glacial deposits, and lahars in the Lewis River Valley. Many Ape Canyon age rocks were altered hydrothermically by volcanically heated groundwater, indicating that an extensive hydrothermal system existed during the latter part of the stage. The Cougar eruptive stage lasted two to 3,000 years. Another dormant interval followed. The Swift Creek eruptive stage took place after that, then a dormant period, then six months eruptive periods followed in succession, making the Spirit Lake eruptive stage. It's said that the Cougar stage was likely the most active St. Helens had been before the Spirit Lake stage. At this time, the volcano produced eruptions that ejected large volumes of ash, lava domes, lava flows, pyroclastic flows, a debris avalanche, and lahars. This debris avalanche would have been the most devastating event of that stage. The Swift Creek stage, on the other hand, was relatively short-lived and marked by the construction of dacite domes. 
USGS's website reads, during the first phase, one tephra deposit and three extensive fans of volcanic debris were emplaced by the collapse of growing and unstable dacite lava domes. During the second phase of the Swift Creek stage, one explosive eruption produced a widespread andesite tephra layer, but no pyroclastic flows or domes have been correlated with this activity. At the end of the Swift Creek time, Mount St. Helens consisted of a cluster of dacite domes with a summit altitude as high as 2,100 meters or 7,000 feet. All in all, Mount St. Helens had nine massive eruptions prior to the infamous one of 1980, each pulse of eruptions lasting up to 5,000 years. Even before the modern eruptive period of the Spirit Lake stage, there's the Goat Rocks period that took place from 1800 to 1857, named after the Goat Rocks Dome of that time. This period is the first time where both oral and written records exist in regards to Mount St. Helens. According to my sources, some Native Americans in the area called Mount St. Helens Luwala Klau, and I'm sorry if I butchered that, but it was also known as Smoking Mountain. And it held a massive importance to the Klickakat people. The most famous Native American lore containing Mount St. Helens in it is the Bridge of the God story. In general though, this volcano held great significance for multiple tribes in the area, but as Europeans colonized the US, it was renamed. In 1792, Captain George Vancouver of the British Royal Navy named the volcano Mount St. Helens to honor one of his fellow countrymen that held the title Baron St. Helens as an ambassador to Spain. Around this time, local Native Americans, as well as early settlers in the then sparsely populated region began witnessing violent outbursts from the volcano. It's said that in 1805, Lewis and Clark described Mount St. Helens as perhaps the greatest pinnacle in America, though they didn't describe any sort of eruption or activity. There was a 26 year time frame between 1831 to 1857, where it was intermittently active and minor steam explosions may have taken place in 1898, 1903, and 1921. Still, the mountain gave almost no evidence of being a risk after 1897. The story of Mount St. Helens is woven from geologic evidence gathered during studies that began with Lieutenant Charles Wilkes' US exploring expedition in 1841. Many geologists have studied Mount St. Helens, but the work of Dwight R. Candle, Donald L. Molino, Clifford P. Hobson, and their associates who began their studies in the late 1950s has particularly advanced knowledge of Mount St. Helens. Their systematic studies of the volcanic deposits, laboratory investigations of rock and ash samples, and radiocarbon dating of plant remains buried in or underneath the ash layers and other volcanic products enabled them to reconstruct a remarkably complete record of the prehistoric eruptive behavior of Mount St. Helens. Generally speaking, no one was really all that prepared for the eruption that was about to take place. There were signs of activity in the 1800s, yeah, but after that, the volcano just kind of seemed to quiet down, not giving anyone any cause for alarm. Unfortunately, the volcano hadn't entered a dormant period, but a massive eruption, and what's now known as the most destructive in the history of the United States was about to take place. On March 16th, 1980, the first signs of activity at St. Helens began after a small series of earthquakes. On March 27th, after hundreds of additional earthquakes, the volcano produced its first eruption in over 100 years. Earthquakes can trigger volcanic eruptions if they're already poised to erupt, like shaking a soda bottle. There has to be enough eruptible magma within the volcanic system and significant pressure within the magma storage region. An earthquake won't simply activate a dormant volcano, but St. Helens had been lying in a state of unrest for some time and the earthquakes in 1980 were the perfect storm. Steam explosions blasted a crater through the volcano's summit ice cap and the Southeast sector of Washington state was covered in dark ash. According to the USGS, within a week, the crater had grown to about 400 meters in diameter and two giant crack systems crossed the entire summit area. Eruptions occurred on average from about one per hour in March to about one per day by April 22nd when the first period of activity ceased. Small eruptions resumed on May 7th and continued to May 17th. By that time, more than 10,000 earthquakes had shaken the volcano and the north flank had grown outwards about 140 meters or 450 feet to form a prominent bulge. From the start of the eruption, the bulge grew outward nearly horizontally at consistent rates of about two meters or 6.5 feet per day. Such dramatic deformation of a volcano was strong evidence that molten rock, magma, had risen high into the volcano. 
In fact, beneath the surficial bulge was a cryptodome that had intruded into the volcano's edifice, but had yet to erupt on the surface. I know you might be thinking, 10,000 earthquakes, how is that possible? But a lot of these were probably incredibly small and not necessarily enough to even feel. For example, in 2018, Alaska had over 50,000 earthquakes in that year alone. Many of these are small and hardly noticeable. However, it was a magnitude 5.1 earthquake on May 18th, 1980 that proved too much for Mount St. Helens. The volcano's northern bulge and summit slid away as a huge landslide, the largest debris avalanche on earth in recorded history happened. The total avalanche volume being equivalent to 1 million Olympic swimming pools, by the way. Angle and slope distance measurements indicate it may have been growing at a rate of up to five feet per day. And by May 17th, part of the volcano's north side had been pushed upwards and outwards over 450 feet. NASA's Earth Observatory site writes, the height of Mount St. Helens was reduced from about 2,950 meters, 9,677 feet, to about 2,550 meters or 8,364 feet as a result of the explosive eruption the morning of May 18th. The eruption sent a column of dust and ash upward more than 25 kilometers into the atmosphere and shock waves from the blast knocked down almost every tree within 10 kilometers of the central crater. Massive avalanches and mud flows generated by near instantaneous melting of deep snow packs on the flanks of the mountain devastated an area more than 20 kilometers to the north and east of the former summit and rivers choked with all sorts of debris and were flooded more than 100 kilometers away. The area of almost total destruction was about 600 square kilometers. Ash from the eruption cloud was rapidly blown to the northeast and east, producing lightning, which started many small forest fires. An eerie darkness caused by the cloud enveloped the landscape more than 200 kilometers from the blast area, and ash could be seen falling from the sky over the Great Plains, more than 1,500 kilometers distant. The devastated area was blanketed by hot debris carried by the ash, and with this release of pressure, pent-up magma began to expand upward toward the vent opening. Less than an hour after the start of the eruption, swift pyroclastic flows poured out of the crater at speeds of 50 to 80 miles per hour and spread as far as five miles north. Prevailing winds blew 520 million tons of ash eastward across the US and caused complete darkness in Spokane, Washington. Ash fell visible as far eastward as the Great Plains, more than 900 miles away. It circled the US for two weeks. During the first few minutes of this eruption, parts of the blast cloud surged over the newly formed crater down to the west, south, and east sides of the volcano. The turbulently flowing hot rocks and gas quickly eroded and melted some of the snow and ice capping the volcano, creating surges of water that eroded and mixed with loose rock debris to form lahars. Several lahars poured down the volcano into river valleys, ripping trees from their roots and destroying roads and bridges. The largest and most destructive lahar occurred in the North Fork Total and was formed by water, originally groundwater and melting blocks of glacier ice, escaping from inside the huge landslide deposit throughout most of the day. This powerful slurry eroded material from both the landslide deposit and channel of the North Fork Total River. Increased in size as it traveled downstream, the Lahar destroyed bridges and homes, eventually flowing into the Cowlitz River. It reached maximum size at about midnight in the Cowlitz River, about 80 kilometers downstream from the volcano. The immediate effects were of course devastating. 57 people died, thousands of animals were killed and hundreds of homes and miles of railway and highways were destroyed. Autopsies indicate that most of Mount St. Helens deaths were from asphyxiation from inhaling hot volcanic ash, though there were some thermal and other injuries as well. Ash clogged sewage systems, damaged cars and buildings and temporarily shut down air traffic. The International Trade Commission estimated damages to timber, civil works and agriculture to be over just $1 billion. 950 million in emergency funds was approved to help with the recovery efforts. One source writes, wildlife in the Mount St. Helens area also suffered heavily. The Washington State Department of Game estimated that nearly 7,000 big game animals, deer, elk, and bear perished in the area most affected by the eruption, as well as all birds and almost all small mammals. However, many small animals, chiefly burrowing rodents, frogs, salamanders, and crawfish managed to survive because they were below groundwater or water surface when the disaster struck. The Washington Department of Fisheries estimated that 12 million Chinook and Coho salmon fingerlings were killed when hatcheries were destroyed. These might've developed into about 360,000 adult salmon. 
Another estimated 40,000 young salmon were lost when they were forced to swim through the turbine blades of hydroelectric generators because the levels of the reservoirs along the Lewis River south of Mount St. Helens were kept low to accommodate possible mudflows and flooding. Many agricultural crops downwind of the volcano were destroyed, though many more survived. In the long term, the ash may have actually provided some beneficial chemical nutrients to the soils of Eastern Washington, so at least the agriculture sector can survive. The forest, streams, and fields will absolutely be able to recover, and while the tourism industry was dealt a crippling blow in the immediate aftermath, in the long term, Mount St. Helens has now become a tourist attraction itself. As for long-term effects, the largest and most notable one has simply been that volcano monitoring has changed for the better. Before 1980, there were sharp divisions among volcano hazard studies, monitoring, and basic volcanology research. The explosion forced scientists to work together, according to my source. Since the eruption of Mount St. Helens, volcano monitoring has evolved from placing a few scientific instruments on a volcano's flanks to a broader integrated network of monitoring devices that measure earthquakes, deformation in volcanic gases, and can detect eruptions or changes on the Earth's surface from space. The evolution of tools like photogametry, geographic information systems, and light detection and ranging enable scientists to make precise measurements and illustrations of changes to Earth's surface, including inflation and deflation at volcanoes. Technological revolutions include telemetry, a broadband seismometer technology, and low power instrumentation capable of collecting and transmitting real-time data remotely with increased precision. Sorry, if you hear Casper just kind of wiggling around in the back. Uh, Efficiency, portability, and value, and with reduced risk to scientists. The Mount St. Helens eruption also gave credibility to US volcanologists who were subsequently invited to participate in the response to volcanic crises in other countries. Scientists at the US Geological Survey, Cascades Volcano Observatory, for example, developed a mobile observatory to help respond to quickly developing volcanic situations. This rapid deployment capability led to the formation of the Volcano Disaster Assistance Program, which is co-funded by the US Agency for International Development and the USGS. VDAP scientists have traveled to volcanoes worldwide to share their experience at Mount St. Helens and to learn from other volcanic events. Since 1986, VDAP has responded to more than two dozen major volcanic crises in a dozen countries. It's also influenced the ENVIEWS or the National Volcano Early Warning System, forced officials to pioneer new ways to reclaim communities from volcanic ashfall, and we've been able to study effects of the eruption on river systems. River water in the area continues to wash enormous loads of sediment downstream at rates of seven tens of times greater than before the eruption. Before the eruption, ecologists and biologists had limited experience observing the direct effect of explosive eruptions on plants and animals as well. Many scientists assumed that life would perish where the most intense volcanic processes affected the landscape and it would take generations to rebuild. However, Snow and ice cover remarkably protected a ton of plants and animals. This wasn't an all life ceases to exist sort of event. Instead, the diversity of life at Mount St. Helens today actually exceeds that of pre-eruption landscapes, such as plants with nitrogen fixing bacteria on their roots can flourish in thicker nutrient poor volcanic sediments and improve habitat conditions for other species. Before 1980, only one seismometer was deployed within 30 miles of Mount St. Helens and a few others were scattered on distant Cascades volcanoes. Scientists' ability to detect rising magma and to make eruption forecasts and warnings to the public was limited because they did not have enough information to thoroughly evaluate volcano behavior. The rapid onset of volcanic activity and repeated eruptions during the 1980-1986 period demonstrated the need for early warning and more advanced monitoring technologies. Mount St. Helens and CVO quickly became research laboratories to improve understanding of volcanic hazards, to develop and evaluate monitoring techniques and to test eruption forecasting methods. Since 1980, the volcano monitoring has evolved from the placement of a few scientific instruments to broad integrated networks of sensors to detect a variety of indications of volcanic activity. Scientists at the USGS, the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, UNAVCO, and other coalitions work in partnership to measure earthquake activity, ground deformation, temperature variations, and the composition and emission rates of volcanic gases. 
Scientists detect and track magma movement beneath volcanoes in real time using a combination of ground-based and remote sensing techniques. They also study the erupted rocks to learn about conditions beneath the volcano, which improves our understanding of how magma moves, how it forms, and the conditions that might trigger an eruption. Having multiple sources of data has helped identify patterns in volcano behavior that improve eruption forecasts. Though the immediate effects and lives lost were tragic, at least there has been some good to come from this. And hopefully the knowledge we have about eruptions like this can prevent further tragedy at Mount St. Helens in the future. But do we even need to be concerned about that? Is it likely there will be another eruption at Mount St. Helens anytime soon? Well, volcanoes are unpredictable, but let's take a look at the modern activity and see what's been going on at St. Helens in recent years. In December, 1989, geologists working in the crater at St. Helens discovered two thin layers of ash separated by fresh snow, evidence that at least two small explosions occurred there recently. The explosions hadn't been seen or heard, but there was some minor deformation of the dome. Generally speaking though, activity has been minimal since the massive event in 1980. But then in 1990, a three hour explosion-like signal was recorded. Residents of central Washington began reporting light dustings of ash on their cars and the dome was deformed. This had been a surprise to scientists leading to a new seismic alarm system. During the next 10 months, 11 more explosion-like seismic events occurred. Only the September 24th event occurred during a period of good visibility. The slow scan video camera on Harry's Ridge showed no plume and two observers on Johnston Ridge, one mile west of the camera, also saw no steam or ash plume during the several hours long event. A closer inspection of the crater by helicopter revealed no obvious changes, except perhaps a stronger than normal sulfur smell. Ash plumes did cancel flights that year. And as of October, 1991, there were four explosion-like seismic events. In other words, St. Helens has been far from quiet. In 2004, these activities became worrying as on October 11th, spines of solid but hot lava punctured the surface of the crater glacier. Crater Glacier being the youngest and fastest moving glacier in North America, rising lava forced it to flow northward around the new lava domes. It grows at such a massive rate inside the crater that it poses threats to the valley below. In 2004, the glacier had grown into a horseshoe shaped feature that wrapped around the 1980-86 lava dome. In late September, 2004, earthquake swarms rocked the volcano and the Southern part of the glacier cracked and bulged. A small explosion on October 1st renamed a crater through the glacier, which was followed about 11 days later by emergence of a lava spine. The lava spine grew and ran down the South Crater Wall in mid-November 2004 and split the glacier into two arms. Continued growth of the lava dome compressed the two glacier arms against the east and west crater walls. As a result, the two glacier arms doubled in thickness and the rate of flow sped up to an average of 20 to 60 centimeters per day or one to two feet per day. By late October, a larger whale back shaped extrusion of solid lava called a spine had emerged from the crater floor. During the three plus years of the eruption, a series of hot, solid, smooth sided lava spines rose from the vent, bulldozed their way across the crater floor and piled to form a new dome 460 meters or 1,500 feet high. In 2005, the tip of a lava spine called the whaleback broke off, causing a rock fall that sent ash and dust into the air. This time period of eruptions have been notable because there were only two explosive events between 2004 to 2008. Both occurred in 2005 when ash was ejected from the volcano. Even so, it's renewed volcanic activity. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's do not underestimate a volcano. As the USGS reports, the first of only two significant explosions occurred on January 16th, 2005 at the start of a winter storm. There were no recognizable precursors. Monitoring instruments located in the crater were destroyed and a few others stopped for hours or seconds long intervals, probably as a result of ash in the air and on instruments blocking radio signals. Ejected ballistic blocks landed hundreds of meters away and ash fell on the volcano's flanks. The second explosion occurred under good viewing conditions late on the afternoon of March 8th, 2005. Again, there were no recognizable precursors, but there was a very subtle increase in seismicity in the few hours before the event. A dense ash cloud rose from the crater and ballistic impact craters were observed in the snow on the north flank of the old dome. 
a dominantly white vapor cloud drifted towards the east northeast, reaching an altitude of 11 kilometers. Minor amounts of ash were erupted and dustings were reported in Elsinburg, Yakima, and Topnish, Washington, as far as 150 kilometers from the volcano. In present day, though Mount St. Helens isn't actively erupting, it's considered to be recharging. There have been earthquake swarms in recent years though, and again, that doesn't necessarily mean an eruption is bound to happen. These swarms are small ones, so it's unlikely that they'll trigger anything unless a larger earthquake happens in the area. Its last eruption was in 2008, so for now, all that's really left to do is wait and watch. I doubt Mount St. Helens will remain quiet for long, but at the very least, I'm hopeful that we'll be properly prepared for when it does, perhaps one day, act out again. But for now, that's where I'm going to end today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure that you click on my Linktree link in the description box so that it'll give you all the information to get to all of my social media, Twitter, Discord, Instagram, you name it, Twitch, it's all there. So thank you all so much for making it to another episode of Prism of the Past. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.